Hey everybody, I'm Brian Clapp, VP of Content and Engaged Learning with WorkInSports.com, and this is the Work in Sports Podcast. Let's talk about retention. In the business world, retention is a big deal as it relates to both customers and employees. Let's take our business for a second, WorkInSports.com. We provide a premium service. We have over 24,000 active sports jobs and internships all in one place. We match your skills to job openings. We connect you with sports employers. We have career training. We do all kinds of cool things to help you develop in the sports industry. Once someone decides to be a member of our site, it makes sense for us to work to retain them. Retention, right? It is easier to keep a current member than to find and create a new one from scratch. Businesses focus heavily on retention through elite customer service, increased value, exclusive offers, and more. Now let's think about it in terms of a sports team. If you have a premium suite sold to a business in town, well, which do you think is more beneficial for your team, for your organization? Getting them to renew for another year or having to go on 20 sales trips to different businesses locally, make pitches, presentations, and negotiate deals to get someone else in there. Of course, it's easier when you have someone renew. Retention matters. But retention isn't just for customers. It's also for your employees. There is literally nothing worse as a manager of people than having one of your best employees leave for another opportunity. When I started at Fox Sports Northwest back in the day, I was coming cross country from Atlanta. I was inheriting a staff and the GM told me during the interview process, the staff had some morale issues. Most didn't feel good about working there. When I came in, I made it my mission to figure out why I need to figure out who could be the pillars of the staff and figure out how to fix the overall problem of morale. Now for me, I identified a complete stud in the building and elevated him to a higher role. Made complete sense. Everyone liked him. Everyone respected him. He was really proficient at his job. Elevating him and showing this is the way we're going to run things now. People are going to have opportunity to grow. Just a smart choice. Okay. Looking back, one of my better choices. But six months later, he left and it crushed me. James Rafferty, if you're listening, I'm still mad at you. Well, anyway, this is when it became really clear to me. Doing everything you can to keep your best people is the absolute best way to operate an organization. You'll never be at 100%. People leave for reasons you can't control. In fact, James and his wife, who was also an incredible performer in our newsroom, and so I lost two great people at once, they left for Montana to go back home. I couldn't control that, but you can sure as hell try. So how do you influence employee retention? Well, there are many ways because everyone has a different trigger for what is important to them. How about culture? Do people enjoy working here? Do they like the environment? Do they have a smile on their face at work? Accountability and process. If you have an efficient system and hold people accountable to their performance, everyone is likely to see that and feel more satisfied. They're not going to be overworked because somebody else isn't being held accountable. That matters. Training, teaching them how to be a stellar performer, showing them what you want and setting them up for success. Career paths, letting the employees see their future. What could be out there for them at your organization? Where is their potential? These are all methods to retain staff and great organizations do all of these things and more because the people are what matter most. One of the organizations doing more than most is ESPN. The ESPN Next program is a big part of ESPN's retention plan. It's the company's premier leadership development program, bringing in the best of the best from around the globe and training them to be even better. The director of the ESPN Next program is today's guest, Celia Busa. Buckle up. We're getting into this. Here's Celia. Hi, Celia. How are you doing today? 
Hi, I'm good. Thank you for having me. Oh, I'm so excited to have you on because as someone myself who broke into the sports media as a production assistant a long time ago, I've been reading about what you're doing at ESPN Next and I've just been in awe and wishing that there was something like that when I was coming in. So tell us a little bit more about this program, its goals and how it was created. Yeah, so... You know, I started nine and a half years ago as a PA and all of the things that we're doing now, I wish I had even nine and a half years ago. Right. Um, So it's really cool now for my my career to kind of come full circle to be um, leading a team that's running a program like this. Um, You know, our goals really is to hire, develop and retain the next generation of ESPN leaders. Um, So for us, that means if you want to go pretty much anywhere in the Walt Disney Company, more specifically at ESPN, we want to start you and we want to start you in production. Um, so before, right, the program was really um, production focused. And if you and you really if you wanted to grow and be, become a producer, this is a great path for you. But if you want to be a programming coordinator or a man or work in management ops, like this is still a good place for you to start. So the way we've kind of shifted our focus in hiring is really around like who are future leaders, right? Instead of necessarily looking at production experience because we can teach you TV, but we can't teach you how to be a leader. Um, So I would say retention really is the most important thing for us. That's really a pillar of what we're trying to accomplish. And like I said earlier, retention to us just means staying at Disney or at ESPN in any capacity. See, that's so interesting because I know when I was coming up in the industry, there was always this like overwhelming concept where we all thought you're going to have to grow for a little bit at your first company. Like I was at CNN Sports Illustrated. And then you're going to have to leave to really propel your career. And that was just always that overriding Mm -hmm. thought. The fact that you guys are focused on retention and keeping your talent in house just makes so much sense. Yeah. And, you know, it's crazy. I I don't know why we hadn't gotten there first. Right. But (laughs) retention is really just a byproduct of having a leadership development program. Right. And just being open, because the more I realize as I'm a leader that I encourage people to go out and look for other opportunities, because really there's only so many AP spots. Right. There's only so many producer spots. And as many people as we bring in, not every single person is going to grow through that path. I thought I was going to grow through that path. I thought I was going to be a feature producer for the rest of my career. And my career took a bunch of left turns in other (laughs) places because I realized down the line, I wanted to be a decision maker. And, you know, you have to go out and find other experience. And luckily for me, I was able to do that in this company. And I realized that there's so much opportunity because we're a business, right? Like you, there's so many other lines of business that people can grow skill sets to kind of help them navigate wherever they want to be right here at home at ESPN. See, we're off to a really good start because I talk about this all the time, that the sports world is a huge business. And when you look at even ESPN, that's a huge business. There's all kinds of opportunities in there. It's just a much cooler, you know, packaging. You're you're in sports. It's much more fun. Uh, I want to get into all the leadership stuff because I think that's a huge part of who you've become and how you're building and growing this program. But I want to get also before we do that, let's get into the weeds a little bit. You have 20 20 production assistants were part of your inaugural cohort. I love that word cohort, by the way. I'm imagining there were far more than 20 people interested. How did you whittle down that list? How did you decide on the right fits and who fits your program and your culture and has that high ceiling? How did you get there? Yeah, so we just welcomed 29 on Monday. So our second cohort started Monday, January 13th. So, you know, and from that 29, we started with 500 applicants and we kind of shut the door at 500 Mm. and then we brought in 41 people for interviews and then hired 29 from there. So what I would say is for us, what we're looking for, this is an entry level program. We understand that. Like I said earlier, we'll teach you TV. We'll teach you like content production, pushing the buttons and how to edit. The one thing that I don't believe that we can teach or, or we're not ready to teach at this point is storytelling ability, right? So what we look for is, can you tell a story? Can you watch video and recognize a story? Can you, can you recognize good video and be able to point that out and know where it goes and where it should live on all these multi-platforms, right? And then we're also just looking for leaders and professionalism, you know? Are you, are you dressed apart? Are you um, answering your questions with detail? Are you curious? Are you, are you asking questions? 
those are the type of people that we look for to bring in here to figure out where are they going to go from here, right? The program is 13 months. So we, they spend their first four weeks in training and then they go into um, two pods. We've kind of broken up all of our sports and shows by pod. So they spend six months in one pod, six months in their next pod. And then at the end of that, they graduate our program and they get promoted to a content associate. So for us, can you tell a story? Do you have sports knowledge? Obviously, right? Because you need to be able to understand the sports that you're going to be covering. Um, and are you curious and do you seek and take feedback? I think the thing for us that, that was really important as we went through this last hiring round, I always say best of the best. This needs to be a very competitive program, right? That's what I say to, to our leadership team. Yeah. But the most important thing is like, do we have some curious thinkers who can come in here and like challenge and take risks? Like, and, and that's hard to screen for Brian. Like it's really hard, <laughs> yeah. but you know, we, we, we find, we find that it's, it's worked out so far, but again, we're, we're seven months into this program. So we still have a lot of room to grow. Well, it's so interesting too, because I talk in different college programs across the country and people say to me, well, how do I stand out in an instance like this? And I'm like, you have to yeah. be, you have to be curious, you have to be coachable and you have to be competitive. Like those are like three in, in really important things in the sports industry. And you mentioned curious and a lot of those other things and being able to storytell. But again, it always gets back to this. Well, how do I show that on my resume? Like, how do I get my resume mm -hmm. to come to life like that or my cover letter or my other materials? So as you go through this process, like, how do you identify that? If you can, if you can characterize it at all, is there a way that you can identify a good storyteller or certain things that you've really liked that have stood out to you? You know, it's, that's hard. And I don't think we figured that out yet, to be honest, from yeah. the resume, right? But our, our interview process is very robust, where it starts with a phone screen. And then from a phone screen, you get passed off into what we call a blue jeans exercise. And in that blue jeans exercise is where they, they're watching a piece of video and they have to talk about the video that they watch. And Ooh, I love that. Point out good video, right? So, and that's before you even get on campus. So those 41 people went through like three other processes before they even got on on campus. So I think that's where we kind of determine, can you story tell? Yeah. Are you curious? But at this point right now, that is our biggest challenge is how do you find that from a resume? And I don't know right now, it's still hard yeah. for me to, for me to, for me to even articulate what that is. It is. It's, it's the biggest challenge that everybody faces is how do I make, how do I read a resume and know that this person has that it factor and they're going to be, I'll have all mm -hmm. those other factors about them and the leadership ceiling and whatever. And you're right. It's probably not until you get some sort of face to face or phone call or video interaction with them that you really learn who they are. It's such a, it's such a tricky process. Anyway, let's move along right. uh, from watching the ESPN next Twitter feed. Uh, I've noticed some really interesting aspects of the program. And one that stood out to me was having NFL analyst Dan Orlovsky working directly with your team, showing them how he watches film, what he looks for, how he breaks down a play. I was like fired up like for the people in the room because I find that stuff so fascinating. How, how do you see it though? How do events like this play into your overall development strategy of your crew? Yeah. So I think for us, the way that we describe our development strategy is like two pronged, right? So we want to develop leaders and we want to develop better producers because you'll always hear me say, while yes, we want you to go on and do all of these other jobs within this company, you have to be really good at the job that you were hired to do, right? So you have to be able to do the job. Now, the Orlovsky example really plays into how we make better producers. And we have a series that's run by um, a highlight producer named Mike Essie called the ESPN Next Film Room. And Orlovsky is one of many people that we've brought in to make them better producers, where he's able to sit down within a room full of production assistants and really break down video that he sees to make them better um, breakdown tape producers, right? Um, we also have things like we bring in the producer of the cover story for that month and we watch the feature on the cover story and then we have the, the PAs in the room ask them questions about the process. So we have a, a thread of those throughout the year and then we also have more um, development opportunities that are geared towards leadership. So that's more like industry 101 where we're sitting down three leaders from across the company that work in different business units that can answer questions about where the industry is going or something like navigating transition or career planning. So we're giving them opportunities across the 13 months that they're here to grow, like I said before, as leaders and as better producers. 
Though during the program, though, when you come in as a cohort PA, you're required to attend 10 of them. So we free you up from your schedule so you don't have to like do that and then go into work afterwards or it doesn't have to conflict with a work shift. And you have to attend 10 of those during your your 13 months that you're here. I, this is this is so funny. Like I'm sitting here listening to you, and I'm like getting geeked up, and like I'm way too old for this program, clearly. But like <laughs> I am like this is so amazing. Like I am fired up just listening to this. Like I'm like ten minimum. I'd be at fifty of these things. Are you kidding me? Like yeah. this, is, this is fantastic. <laughs> I can't believe you have to argue with anybody to coming to like watch video with with Dan Orlovsky. Mm-hmm. I mean that would be fantastic. Okay, so let's dig into you. You know, it's funny Go though, ahead. Brian. Like really quick, it, it's it's. It's funny because when I was a PA, like these things still happened, right? But they weren't mandatory and no one was freeing me up. And I just, I as a PA just didn't think that I could step away, right, for my own development because it was an afterthought. It was like, here's these things that you can attend and you should if you can find time, but they're not mandatory. And we believe making them mandatory really gives people an opportunity to understand the importance of development over the course of their career. And we hope that they continue to attend these things that are still available for them after they graduate the program. It's so true. When I look back at like my early career and, and not realizing you, you don't think long term early in your career, you don't think mm-hmm. about developing yourself or like that. You think about how do I get through today? You know, how do I do the best I can right. today? And then I'll worry about tomorrow, tomorrow. And that's totally logical. And yet when you can get that broader view and you can kind of see further into the future of how this will benefit you and by making it mandatory, maybe that's the way it, it all starts to come together and you see that. So let's talk about let's talk about you a little bit. This is a big program, long term benefits for the cohorts and the organization as a whole. But how did you get into this role and how would you define your role in all of this? Yeah, so I, like I said, I started as a, as a production assistant nine and a half years ago. Um, I kind of rose through the ranks in um, production, produced features for College Game Day for a couple of years, and then really realized where I want my career to go. This is about year four, I guess, in my career. Um, and I took a complete left turn and um, joined a team called Production Enhancements that at the time was really like a liaison between technology and production. Oh, so cool. I still had a hand in production, but I also was dipping into the technology side. Um, I did that for a couple of years um, and then transferred into creative services. Production enhancements was under the creative services umbrella um, and was a graphics manager for a couple of years. And I also have zero graphic design experience, but I needed that people management experience. Okay. Yeah. So I got that there. Um, and then I went into a technology role, a full-time technology role um, based on the relationships that I built while I was in that production enhancements role. And I did that for about 15 months. And then three days before I went on maternity leave, the job for this um, this department opened up to run <laughs> this program opened up. And I was like, this has to be the worst time ever, but I'm going to throw my name in the ring. And three weeks after I had my baby, I, I interviewed. I had three interviews. Um, along the way, I was like, I don't know if this is for me. I don't know if this is for me. I knew the job was for me, but I didn't think the timing was right, right. for me. But my husband was like, no, you have you have to keep going. You have to keep going. Take yourself out of the running afterwards. Like don't decide right now until the process is over. And I went in for an interview with Tina Thornton, um, who's SVP of production. And she's also uh, Jimmy's chief of staff. And I left that interview and I said, if I don't get this job, I'm going to be so upset. Right. Because I knew that working for her and the type of leadership that she had was going to be instrumental for me and my career and working in this program. Um, And then I got the job offer and I never went back to my technology job. I came off of maternity leave right into (laughs) a month before this program launched. So, you know, this program was in the works before um, the job opportunity even came up for me. So, but I knew because I had always had kind of a hand still in production in in some mentorship aspect over the five years that I was gone for production that this was my goal to get back in some capacity with whatever iteration of this program was going to be at that time. So what does your role look like now? now? Yeah. What does your role look like now as part of this whole, this whole group? Yeah. So, you know, I, I work with a team of our, what our leadership team, we have three managers, um, one who is over the pod system. His name is Jeff McGuire and he really facilitates where um, PAs are placed and what pod they're going to be working in and what their assignments um, are. And he works with our senior leaders to kind of run those pods. Um, And then we have a training and development manager, Jenna Pierpont, 
who is who sets our curriculum for the year for each one of the cohorts and she has a uh, coordinating or, or coordinator and excuse me a training coordinator that works with her nicole debell and we take training very seriously as you know we have four weeks of training before they even set foot in um in the job and nicole is also there to um take people offline if they need additional training later so training for us lasts all year long not just those four weeks when the cohort first starts um and then we have our hiring and recruiting manager kevin mcdonald who's really digging into what a success profile looks like for us and who we need to hire and working with our talent acquisition team to really figure out out, um, who, wh- where, where should be, where should we be recruiting and who we need to bring in to interview and hire. Um, and my goal and my, my role in all of this is really just to kind of set the vision of what I want the program to be and what we want the program to be and work with our leadership team to determine that. And I'm sorry, Nick Akinfora also works with us. He's a court, he's another coordinator and he, um, does a lot of our internal and external marketing. So he runs all of our social media media channels, all of the really cool stuff that you see um, externally is all, um, all Nick. Um, but, you know, the five of us really work really closely together. The six of us really work closely together to push this vision forward. We are actually going to be taken offline in a couple of weeks to say, what is next 2.0 look like for us and how do we get there? Because we've been running ever since the July cohort got here and we haven't had a chance to just like stop and say, how do we get better? Because the biggest thing for me and how I lead is how do you hold me accountable? How do you hold the team accountable? And and that's the first thing that I said to the PAs is you can come to me and to us for anything. And I want them to be the change that they want to see in this program. So accountability and honesty and integrity are like the biggest things for me and how I lead. And it trickles down to our leadership team as well. I think that's really smart too to, di- to dial back once things get kind of intense a little bit and say, okay, what's working? You know, where can we go next? Yeah. What do we need to change or tweak? Because if you just keep grinding, you miss things. And it's smart to kind of pull back and say, all right, let's take a deep breath and see what's next. I saw this really cool quote from you regarding ESPN as a whole. And you said, the opportunities are here. The opportunities here are endless as long as you work hard advocate for yourself and you tell people what it is you want to do. I thought that last part really stood out to me. The second part too, advocate for yourself and then telling people what it is you want to do. How important is that? You know, everybody everybody always talks about working hard, being diligent, showing results, but how important is it to identify what you want and communicate that? So it's, it's very important. And it was very hard for me. Um, when I first got here, I thought that if I just put my head down and I worked really hard, like everyone, right? Like I, I would eventually move my way up the ladder. And I realized in a company with thousands of employees, it's really hard to do that. And I fortunately had a mentor of mine to pull me aside, um, a CP. And he said to me, you know, it's not enough to just put your head down and work hard. You have to tell people what you want to do. And it's funny because I told him, I was like, okay, well, I really want to work on OTL. And he was like, okay, that's great. But, you know, you should also think about working on the NFL. And at the time, it never even occurred to me to work on the NFL. And and getting on the NFL project changed the traje- trajectory of my career. So, you know, I use that always as an example is when I tell people, um, tell PA specifically when they walk in the door here that you have to communicate because no one is mind readers, right? And the more that you can tell people what you want to do and what you want your career to look like, as well as demonstrating capabilities on a regular basis, people will think of you when opportunities come up because the best position you can be in is someone knows what you want to do. Someone knows how good you are at the job that you're doing and an opportunity is available and they can think of you for that opportunity before it's even posted. Because a lot of times, not for entry level programs like ours, but for other positions, by the time they're posted, they already have two, three, four people in mind because these other people have networked and built relationships and met people and told people what they wanted to do. So I encourage everyone in the industry, right? Not just the folks who walk in the door here to, voice what it is that you want you want to do and who you want to be down the line so that people can help you get there 
We've had 250 episodes of this podcast, and I literally think that might be the most intelligent thing that's ever been said. So congratulations. You get you won. <laughs> you. you won that for sure today. So thank you. That was awesome. Uh, I, I, it was funny. As you were talking, I was thinking early in my career, I thought everybody else around me was smarter and better, and therefore I had to outwork everybody. And I thought if I kind of ran around from place to place and showed like hustle, that was showing me really well. And my boss took me aside one day and said, the more you run around, the more I think you're unorganized. And I was like, uh, <laughs> okay, you know what I mean? But it was like all those little moments where you don't realize these, these little things, these little parts you're missing uh, of like not saying what you want or thinking you're putting on a show by running around or whatever it is. There's all these little things you can pick up from, from just being aware in those moments and, and voicing and understanding who you want to be moving forward. And I think it's, it's really interesting sometimes to look back and see, you know, different choices we all could have made, but, um, so let's talk a little bit more about leadership because this term gets used a lot as you guys define ESPN next. Uh, it's in a lot of your press releases and a lot of your videos, leadership, 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 and developing leaders. I love that. But what does it really mean to you? You kind of talked about your tenets of leadership earlier, but I mean, leadership to a lot of people is something that's kind of you're born with. How do you develop that and grow that within the people that are part of this program? Yeah. So I, I, I do believe that I'm kind of in the school of, of you're born with it, but I do believe that it can be further developed and brought out of people who may not even know that they have it. Right. And I think a lot of that has to do with providing people with opportunity to grow. Um, one of the things that we do is um, every cohort that comes in has what's called a cohort project, and it's a business project where they um, have to ideate um, and present ideas around a problem or a, a growing area or something that we have that we've, we've given to them. They have four months to, to work on this. And during the time there, they really have an opportunity to step up with their with their cohort group and be a leader of their cohort group that they're they're working with, right? And also get in front of a lot of leaders throughout various departments in the company as they start to research and talk to people in programming or talk to people in creative services. And then they present in front of um, Jimmy senior staff. We'll we'll have our first presentation from our first cohort um, at the end of February. And I think for us and and the way that we want to build leaders is like I said earlier with those development courses that really talk to them about their brand, right? About professionalism, about, about tapping into these things that we believe that they have because we've hired them and brought them here um, to do that, but also providing opportunity for them to grow within their assignment or in things that we're giving them to show that they can step out from the pack. Right. If that's what they want to do, it's not for everybody. I know that leadership is not for everybody and not every company has a, 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 you know, a sea full of leaders. There's some people who just want to come in and do their work and go home and that's fine. Um, but for us, we want to at least give you the opportunity to identify that in yourself. And if it is, we're going to foster it and we're going to grow it. And that's through those things, like I said earlier, with our, our programs and our, our opportunities. So any of us that have advanced in our career and reached some level of height that we may not have even originally thought we were going to reach, we can all thank others for making a difference, helping us get there, teaching us things, mentoring us. What does it mean to you personally to be a mentor in this role and help guide this new generation of talented people? It means everything to me because I have personally benefited from mentors and advocates and I still benefit from mentors and advocates. And I am thankful that I had people before I even knew that I needed them step up and tell me what I needed to hear and, and what I, what I didn't want to hear at times about right. how I was navigating my career. And that's the role that I play on a daily basis for our production assistant and content associate population. And even APs that, I, that you know, I have, folks that I have mentored that are now in many roles um, past the production assistant level. But the joy that I get from sitting down with a PA within their first weeks, months that they've been here and asking them about where they want to be and what they want to do and helping them connect the dots on how to get there and connect with people on how to get there is, is, the best thing that I could do in my career. When I've said, I've, I've said before that this is a dream job for me. And that is really the aspect that makes it a dream job. It's so important to me that we have made a peer mentor program. So every person who comes in as a cohort is required to have a peer mentor. And that's a six month commitment from um, two of them. And that's going to be at the content associate level or AP level. And so that they can understand 
the importance and the value of a mentor. And then at the end of that commitment, we hope that they go out and they find other mentors within the company. I'm still helping to connect people with mentors, even on my leadership team. Every day I'm asking, I'm asking some of my managers, who's mentoring you? Who are, who are you talking to? Who do you have that's in your corner that doesn't have a stake in what you're doing day to day? Because that's what people forget. Like, it's all well and good for me to be a mentor of, of a manager that works with me, but they need someone who doesn't have a stake in what they're doing every single day in their corner, more importantly than what I'm doing. And so helping people build that around them and build those relationships and network with people is, is worth its weight in gold. So I'm coming to the conclusion that ESPN was really smart for hiring you into this role because you, <laughs> you, you got this down. I mean, it is great. I mean, you're you're inspiring and you're giving me the chills when you talk about this stuff. So I'm a big uh, attitude and approach guy. ESPN is a huge organization. Lots of people. It's like going to a huge, uh, large, you know, college campus. You can you can blend in and you can not even be heard from again or you can just do your little thing and go home. That's fine. Like you said earlier. Or you can, you know, kind of thrive there and some people will thrive and some people won't. What do you say is the right attitude to be successful at a place like ESPN? You have to operate from a place of yes. And that doesn't mean say yes every single time, but that means that you got to try to say yes. Right. I think for us at, at ESPN, you're going to be required to wear a bunch of different hats all the time, regardless what, what job that you're in and being someone who's always willing to go the extra mile and, and work with your team and pick up the slack where there is some is huge. And it, it's really what makes people move throughout this company. In addition to that, it's ideas, it's pitching ideas and not being afraid to pitch ideas. Even if you just walked in on day one, that's okay. We still want to hear what you have to say. That's why you're here. Um, being creative and also ideas don't stop once you become promoted to a content associate, right? Like even me today in my career, nine and a half years in, I'm always thinking of ways to make ESPN better, to make our our program better, to, to send ideas for shows that I watch. It never stops. And if you ever stop ideating, you might as well get out of this industry because this whole industry functions that way. And I would also say being a risk taker, I tell the PAs on their first day, don't ever be risk averse. It's okay to fail because you took a risk here specifically, because if you didn't take a risk, then you're, you're not challenging yourself every single day. We'd rather you fail and take a risk, but not fail the same thing multiple times over and over again. Um, but if you're failing every day because you're taking a risk every day, that's, that's okay because that risk is different. And you decided that, you know what, I'm going to try something new in your highlight. Maybe it didn't go over well. And maybe your highlight producer says, you know what, we're not going to do that this, this time, but that's okay because you did take a risk to present an idea that was out of the box because one of those is going to land at some point. And that idea that lands may be the biggest idea that changes what we do or how we do things here. So just to sum that up, ideas and creativity, being a risk taker and going above and beyond and, and making sure that you're, you're a team player. It's so great. I had a reporter that worked for me when I was at Fox Sports Northwest and every day he'd come in with 10 ideas and nine of them would mm-hmm. be like throwaways. Like nine of them would be like, no, I'm not going to dress up, you know, in a, in a clown fit outfit today and go to the used car dealership or whatever it was, you know, like some crazy outlandish idea that we were going to get like each row to dress up like that. And, and, but then he'd have one idea that would be gold every day. And I kept telling him, I'm like, don't self censor every time come in with everything, you know, bring it to me and let's talk. And I love that attitude yep. that you're presenting there is like, you can't go wrong when you're coming up with lots of ideas because something's going to come through. And I love that, that you have that kind of an open attitude towards it. Um, we'll finish up with this. Cause I know you're busy. You got a lot of <laughs> people probably knocking on your door. Um, when someone finishes this program, I know your ideal is that they will continue on within ESPN, but what is your hope that they'll have gained from it as themselves? Like if they were going to say, oh my gosh, this program did this for me. How would you articulate that? What is your hope that every one of them will graduate from this program with? So I I would say 
first and foremost, I hope that they have a great grasp on how to create content because that's what they're being brought here to do, right? Like all of the leadership talk is great and it's important and it's a huge pillar of what we're doing, but we're bringing in PAs to make content. So I do hope that over the course of time that they're great content pr producers, as great as you can be in a 13 month span um, and a firm background on how to create content because I believe that that's going to take you to any department and, and like knowing how to do that is going to help in whatever job that you go towards. Also, I hope that you have the confidence and awareness on how to grow, right? How do you move throughout this company? How do you network? How do you, how do you put yourself in front of people before an opportunity presents itself? And then I also hope that you have the exposure to senior leaders across the company. We are going to provide that opportunity in the form of the cohort project, but the onus is also on the production assistant to set up a meeting with whoever it is that they want to talk to. Every single person at this company will sit down for a meeting. It doesn't matter who it is. It could be a senior vice president, an executive vice president. No one that I've come across in my career, and I've met with a lot of people, has said no, and I've never come across a PA who also ran into a closed door. So I hope that they know that they should be taking advantage of, of that opportunity. So I think it's those three things, is, is how to create content, make sure you're confident and aware on how to grow, and you have ex the exposure that you're, that you're looking for, that I hope you're looking for anyway. Celia, I can't thank you enough. This is fantastic. This is the exact type of content and motivation and perspective that our audience needs and is dying for. They want to hear this sort of thing from somebody that's been in there like you have. So thank you so much for coming on the show, sharing more about your program and just your overall vision for it all. It's just, it's great. It's inspiring. Thank you so much. No problem. Thank you again for having me. I really appreciate it. There is so much I loved in that interview. Seriously, you know, in the first minute or two, when you hit it off with someone, you just get into a flow, you like their vibe and that, and then the interview, you just know it you just know it's going to go great. So Celia just impressed the hell out of me. Thank you for tuning in. Please remember to subscribe, share, post a review wherever you listen. We love having you as part of our community and I'd like to retain you as listeners. See how I brought it all back? Professional at work here. All right, everyone. Get back to work. <laughs>